Persuasion sits at the center of all business activity and life in general. Customers must be convinced to buy your products and services, staff and colleagues to go along with a new strategic plan or reorganization, investors to buy or not sell your stock, and partners to sign the next deal. But despite the critical importance of persuasion, most leaders, most executives struggle to communicate, yet alone inspire. We can engage our listeners at a whole new level if we toss out the PowerPoint slides, nothing here, and learn to tell good stories instead. As Robert McKee points out, stories fulfill a profound human need to grasp a pattern of living, not merely as an intellectual exercise, both, but within a very personal and emotional experience. A big part of a CEO's job, a leader's job, is to motivate people to reach certain goals. To do this, we need to engage people's emotion, and the key to the heart is story. There are two ways to try and persuade people. The first is with conventional rhetoric, and this is what most executives and leaders are trained in. And it generally consists of a PowerPoint slide presentation in which you put up a slide that says, you know, here's our company's biggest challenge, and this is what we need to do to win. And then you go on to build your case by giving facts and figures and statistics and quotations from authorities. But there are two problems with rhetoric. The first is the people that you're talking to have their own set of benchmarks and statistics and authorities. While you're talking to them, they're already arguing with you in your heads. And the second is, even if you do manage to persuade people like this, you've done so only at an intellectual level. And that's not good enough. Because people are not inspired to act by reason alone. Just take, take buying a new car, for example. If anybody's bought a Mercedes or a BMW, there's probably a dozen reasons why you shouldn't buy that car. It's expensive to run, it's more prone to get stolen, uh, the insurance costly, um, et cetera, et cetera. But we buy it anyway because of something emotional. The other way to try and inspire people, and ultimately in a much more powerful way, is by uniting an idea with an emotion. The best way to do this is by telling a compelling story. In a story, you not only get to weave a lot of information into the telling, but you also get the opportunity to arouse the listener's emotions and energy. Persuading with a story is not easy, though. Any intelligent person can sit down and make lists. It takes rationality, but very little creativity to design an argument using conventional rhetoric. But it requires vivid insight and storytelling skill to present an idea that packs enough emotional power to be truly memorable. If you can harness imagination and the principles of a well-told story, you can get people rising to their feet rather than yawning and ignoring you. So what, what is a story? Essentially, a, a story describes how and why life happens. It generally begins with a situation in which life is relatively in balance. You go to work day after day, week after week, month after month, and everything is, is fine and you expect it'll stay that way. And then something happens. In screenwriting and filmmaking terms, we call that the inciting incident or the call to adventure. And it's an, it's an event. You get a new job, the boss dies of a heart attack, a big customer threatens to leave you. An event happens which throws life out of balance. And then the story becomes about how balance is restored. And um, in, the, in, the, in the storytelling, we basically go along with a protagonist, a hero, whose subjective expectations crash into uncooperative object of reality in an effort to restore balance. A good storyteller describes what it's like to deal with these opposing forces, calling on the hero, the protagonist, to dig deeper, to work with scarce resources, to make difficult decisions, to take action despite risk, and ultimately to discover the truth. All great storytelling from the dawn of time, from the ancient Greeks through to Shakespeare to present day, have all dealt with this fundamental conflict between subjective expectations and cruel reality. I'm now going to tell you some stories about our internet adventure and what we learned along the way. My one partner uh, always said to me that behind every successful entrepreneur is a Jewish mother. 
And um, if I think back to when we started, we had all our mothers running around, fetching our dry cleaning, organizing us travel visas and whatever else needed to get done. And I read uh, a very a, a great story about uh, Jewish mothers and it's, it's got quite an entrepreneurial fl flair to it. So the story goes that uh, I move into an apartment with uh, this lovely lady, Lorato, that I uh, met uh, backstage. And, uh, and time goes on and my mother, who's, you know, wants me to get married and slow down, keeps hucking me and going, but Ronnie, she's so nice. What do you mean you guys moved in together? I said, Mom, we're just friends. She's, that's a very modern concept. My parents are much more from the old school. I said, what do you mean you're just friends? I said, we're just friends. And my mother baits us. She phones from the cell phone one day and says, I'm downstairs, I'm coming for dinner. You know, invites herself, that's pretty cool. And we have this lovely dinner and she keeps asking questions and niggling about, you guys look so great together and you know, when is the marriage date? And we just said, we're just friends. We've got our own bedrooms. I don't know what you're talking about. And mom's not satisfied, but you know, she goes home and uh, we start packing up the house and we start putting things away. And Narata says, you know, we used to have, we had a housewarming gift, this beautiful silver sugar bowl. And I say, well, I don't know where it is. And we look and we look, we cannot find it. And I think, well, my mother must have taken it, but that's bizarre. And how do you ask your mother if she took something like that? Well, you accuse her of stealing. So in this new age, we decided to send her an email. And I said, dear mom, it was great that you invited yourself for dinner. Thank you so much for just, you know, popping over to check on us. And I've got saying to ask you, I'm not saying you did take it. And I'm not saying you didn't take it. All I'm saying is we used to have a very nice silver sugar bowl. We can't find it. Maybe you know something about it. My mother writes back, she's not the biggest emailer, a couple of weeks pass, we get an email back, dear son, you and your friend look very happy together, you know, I'm glad everybody's settled in and, uh, you know, and, and then my mom says, look, I'm not saying that you, you know, that you are sleeping with her, and I'm not saying you aren't sleeping with her, all I'm going to say is if she slept in her own bed, you would have found the sugar bowl by now, <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, the, the, message, the message of the story is you, you cannot lie to your mother. <laughs> a big thing that I learned in my short career in business, it's been about 17 years now, I think I'm, I'm just starting to understand what business is about, is that we don't invest in ideas or things. We invest in people. The one man who mentors quite a few of us said that, you know, you'd rather invest in a bad business with good people than in a good business with bad people. Because the truth of the matter is you can take the most average idea and give it to enthusiastic, humble, hardworking people and they'll make a big go of it. And you can take a brilliant idea, a brilliant movie script, a brilliant business plan, and you can give it to arrogant, lazy people and they'll mess it up. And it's, 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 it's not an obvious thing. You know, ideas don't move mountains. Ideas don't make money. People, people make money. People make things happen. And ultimately, the only thing you invest in are, in are in people. That's why the topic of the speech, there's no bad businesses, only bad people. Also, selling is about listening. A lot of people think that selling is about talking. Ultimately, when you listen to people, you're emotionally connecting with them. In 1996, uh, Jeremy Ord gets a call to go and give a presentation at Edgar's. And... Um, he said, Ronnie, you're the internet guy. I'm going to pick you up. So he drives from the Oval. I'm standing on the street corner and Jan Smuts by the ice building in Rosebank. I jump in his car. We go through to Edgar's to the executive dining room. It was a, it's a classic story, this. Um, the then CEO chairman at the time, Mr. Etheridge, was a very impressive looking man, but it was a very kind of stiff culture. It was like we got introduced to Mr. FD, Mr. Chairman, Mr. CEO. Uh, I always called the guy Mr. Belvedere. I got very confused. And... Um, Jeremy stands up, they're having lunch, and he says, thanks for having us, you know, I'm going to hand over to Ronnie, he knows about the internet, uh, we are their partners, he's going to give you the talk. I start talking, and Mr. Etheridge is fidgeting, doesn't look very relaxed at all. About a minute into the talk, I say to him, but sir, how do you see the internet, you know, affecting the fashion world? And he said, how do I see it? He says, good question. He spoke for an hour, me and Jeremy leave, as we're leaving, he says that was the best presentation he'd ever been to. <laughs> Jeremy punches me in the ribs and goes, genius. I said, what genius? I didn't, didn't, didn't want to shut up. We sent them a proposal, 
and we got the IT department writing to us saying, Jesus, you guys know a lot about our business. I said, well, are you kidding? I was like writing everything he said down. And all we did is like, you know, put it into like a story and send it back to them. But that was a, a fantastic exercise in, uh, in selling and learning about the power of listening. Thank you very much.